As you know, we're in a time of transition for our worship service. This is not our last online worship service, but it's our last one of this kind that is purely online and not recorded in our church building. And before we rush past this Sabbath into next, I just want to pause and say a big thank you to everyone who's made it possible. First, we praise God. He's been so faithful to us. And I want to say thank you to everyone who's contributed by recording video and sending it in. It is not easy. It's a lot of work to get the right light and the right uh, camera and to send it in. And it takes time. And I just want to say thank you for doing that because you've made it possible for us to worship together in a meaningful way. And I want to say a big thank you to those who put the service together. It takes hours of work to do this. And much of that has been done by Garrick. Garrick. Thank you so much. You've been awesome. And many others have helped out. I know Charles, you've done a lot of work and a lot of those hours have been late night hours where you're fixing things so that we can have our service available to us. And there's so many others who've given in other ways as well, like our children's church, an amazing production. I thank you, Lanessa and Nina. You've done an awesome job. And others who we haven't seen their service as much, like those who have mowed the yard right behind me. And we didn't come to church to see it, but it was beautiful and they were faithful and it glorified God to have our building and our facilities looking so nice. And so many others who have been a blessing to the church during this time with your spiritual support and your encouragement. We have a church board who has met many, many times on Zoom and done good, faithful work. And I'm so blessed to work with godly people like our church board. So thank you. We've had a real blessing from God in this time where we've worshiped purely online. And as we transition back into the service, you want to know what to expect and people are asking me. And so there are communication, e-news and online about what to expect. But I just will highlight some of those things. There's a letter sent out on the e-news. It looks something like this. And as you look at the letter, you'll see our service will be shorter. The doors will open at 11 a.m. and close at 12.30. Um, PM and the one hour service will start at 1115. Uh, we are strongly encouraging face coverings and so we'll make those available when you come in if you don't have one but we are not requiring them so just so you understand that when you come to the worship service you will be gathering with those some who do not have face masks and you just need to be aware of that and be able to make your own uh, responsible decisions about uh, your, with your own comfort level on that. We are going to have one side of the church reserved for those who are wearing face masks or face coverings so that you won't have to sit next to someone um, who's not if you are more comfortable that way. We will not be um, providing Sabbath school programming at this time. We're looking forward to that but not quite yet. And we will not be doing congregational singing. Uh, that is hard. Boy, I want to sing together. It'll be a beautiful sound when we can do that. There will be music in our service, but we're just asking, uh, asking us all to not project and uh, make that risk of exposure through singing. And all these things are, are changing quickly, and, and we'll, we'll be uh, assessing those as we go forward. Uh, we're not passing an offering plate, so there'll be other ways to give. We're not passing out uh, bulletins, but there'll be digital bulletins. And we are going to be recording attendance. And so this is for the purpose of contact tracing. We're going to keep that record for four weeks and we're just going to use our videos, uh, surveillance cameras, and our guest book to help us with that. And so those are some of the precautions we're taking to open in a responsible way. And we're looking forward to that time. And you know, so much has changed. We can make a, a list of all the things that have changed and it's a big list, but the more important list is those things that haven't changed. And at the top of that list is a God who is love and who is faithful to us and will never leave us or forsake us. And he's coming back soon. And he is in charge of this church. And I'm so glad to be a part of that church. And so before we rush past this Sabbath, let's just enjoy God and his rest on this Sabbath and be blessed by this worship service. I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. And I just invite you wherever you're at, whatever's on your heart, to bring that before God in a personal way. As I pray in general for our needs, bring your heart to Him and let's join together from wherever we are before God's throne. Let's pray. 
Father in heaven, you are unlimited. You are with each one of us intimately. And I praise you for the way that you lead your church. And I do realize that there's so much hurt and stress. Uh, it's difficult times. And so we bring those to you in general, all of our difficulties that we go through, and you hear the specific ones on each heart. I pray that you would minister to those. You would calm us. You would heal us. You would comfort us. You'd give us courage. Lord, I ask also for the joys in our lives, that we would let those minister to us and that we would enjoy those and live in gratitude. I praise you for the home churches that are beginning this week, the, the Friday night Vespers that um, just started up and the one this evening. I pray that your spirit would be among those as they worship in their own home with other church members. I pray for your spirit here in our online service, especially for those who are going to continue to worship online as we move forward, that they would meet you in this service. And I pray for our gathering next Sabbath when we open our doors and there are some who will be worshiping right here in the building, that we could be in your presence and that you would be the leader of all we do. Lord, we surrender our lives and we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For praise songs, our first song will be The Battle Belongs to the Lord. In heavenly armor will enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. The weapon that fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. Now the world of darkness comes in like a flood. The battle belongs to the Lord. Raise up a standard, the power. Belongs to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. Our next song is Just a Closer Walk with Thee. Amen. 
Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'm glad the children are here and if you want to hear a children's story, come on up close to the screen and listen to this. I've got some berries to show you today. It's a fun day to be out in the woods. We have a few acres in our yard and I'm going to show you some special berries, particularly red ones that we have in the yard and maybe at the end we'll learn a lesson about those berries. But first let's see what I have on the table right here. Here's a selection of six reddish berries that we have in our yard. Now some of these are pretty tasty, some are not so tasty, and one is very dangerous. So the lesson you need to learn is to be very careful when you're eating wild things. Always ask an adult before you eat it so that you don't get sick. One berry in this pile is very dangerous and kids have no, been known to get very sick from eating it. So do you know what these berries are? Well, let's go into the woods, take a look around, and we'll see what these berries actually are. The first berry I want to show you is this little guy right here. This is the trailing raspberry. It's a close relative of the raspberries you might have in your garden, but it's much smaller. It takes a lot of these to actually make anything worth eating, but it can be fun to nibble on if you're out in the woods. 
the trailing raspberry. Ah, this little red berry is getting pretty scarce in our yard. This is a red currant. They're pretty tasty, although very sour. They make very good jam. But these berries actually tend to ripen much sooner than the rest and are often gone by now. But here's one lone survivor. They're the red currant. Fun berry. Let's go find another one. The next berry can sometimes be hard to find because it hides on the bottom of the plant, underneath the leaves hanging down. This is the watermelon berry. Why is it called a watermelon berry? Well, some people think it tastes like watermelon, but it's actually just a very wet berry with a whole bunch of seeds like a watermelon. They're fun to spit out, but not very tasty. Other people say it looks like a watermelon, that shape, and that's probably true. But this berry is fun to make into a jelly. Watermelon berry jelly is pretty fun and tasty. And if you're very thirsty, all of that liquid inside can help you not be thirsty anymore. But it's not super sweet. This is the watermelon berry. Some of you might recognize this berry. This is a high bush cranberry. They're pretty tart, which means they're kind of sour, and they have a great big seed in them. So they're not really that fun to eat raw, but if you make a jelly out of them, they can be pretty tasty. And you might recognize the plant as well. This high bush cranberry plant is responsible for that stinky sock smell we smell in the fall in the woods here in Alaska. Don't know why, but the high bush cranberry just stinks. Let's go find some more. Now here's a patch of pretty berries. These little guys grow really close to the ground and are bright red, very pretty. The common name for these is a dwarf dogwood. Kind of a crazy name. These are not edible per se. In other words, you really don't want to eat them, but these won't make you sick. They just don't taste very good. Dwarf dogwood. There's one more berry I want to show you. Let's go find it. Ah, so this last berry can make you very sick. This is one we need to be very careful about in the woods and not eat it. This is called the red bane berry. This berry actually has a poison called ranunculin. It can make you feel like you've got real bad stomach ache and can even cause some kids to be so sick they have to go to the hospital. So this is a berry that's a deceiver. It looks very tasty, but it is not good at all. So are we going to stay away from this one? I sure hope so. Don't eat the red bane berry. So who remembers the names of the berries that we saw this morning? Do you remember this one? The trailing raspberry? Kind of tasty, but awful small. And then this next one was the red currant. Pretty sour, but it makes really good jam. And then this one is a watermelon berry. Very wet. In fact, let's squish it and see what we can get. Woof. Oh, look at all that water coming out. And there's a seed. So that's a watermelon berry. And then we saw this one here, the high bush cranberry. This is the one with the great big pit. And we can probably see that too. Doink! What a mess. There's the seed right there. Most of that berry is actually seed. And then we looked at one that wasn't very good to eat. This one is the dogwood, dwarf dogwood, and it's just kind of a mealy, yucky berry. And then, do you remember the deceiver? This is the bad one. This is the one we need to be real careful about, the red bane berry. And it grows on the top of a plant with spikes, as you saw, and it has a line down the middle. 
Your parents might notice that line and think it might remind them of something like an apricot. But yeah, that line tells you that's a red baneberry, and it's certainly not good to eat. Do you know that the Bible calls the devil a deceiver? He looks good. It sounds good, what he says, but it's not true. He's deceiving us. Just like this red baneberry looks good, but it sure is not healthy and it's not good to eat. Maybe you can have your parents talk to you this afternoon and show you some Bible verses that talk about the devil being a deceiver. The Bible says that a lot. And so let's remember, kids, when you're out in the woods, be very safe. Look out for deceivers and don't eat the berries unless your parents say it's okay. I hope you've enjoyed the story today. And I hope to see you next time at Palmer Church Children's Story. The scripture reading today is John 10, 1 through 6. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the sh same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. John 10, 1-6. In January of this year, we had a business meeting, and we began that meeting by reflecting on the story of Samuel, the one when God calls his name. And he didn't know what he was hearing, but he talked with Eli and he learned the prayer, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening.
And at that time, I invited the church to join me in in making that our prayer for 2020. We did not know that our lives were about to be disrupted by a virus. We did not know that we only had a few more worship services in our church building before it would sit empty for the next six months. And we don't know what's next. How do you make sense of any of this other than to pray, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I believe that God inspired that focus for our church. And I believe it's the focus we need to have as we transition now into worshiping in our church building. And that's the focus of this message, that God would speak to us individually and speak to us as a church and that we would be led by God. Would you join me in praying as we open the word? Father in heaven, thank you for your faithfulness to lead your people, to speak to us. You've been speaking to us in this time. You've spoken to us before. You will lead us by your voice as we move forward with you. And we ask that right now you could have our ears, that we could surrender our attention to you and that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our text today is John chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. It's an illustration about a shepherd who speaks and sheep who hear his voice. And it comes out of a conversation that Jesus is having after he healed a man who was born blind. So the flow of chapter 9 ends with this conversation where Jesus says this. This is verse 36. For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. So some of the Pharisees started to piece together what he was saying and said, Hey, are you calling us blind? And Jesus replied in verse 41, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. So that's how chapter 9 ends. And that's the conversation that leads Jesus to say what he said about the sheep and the shepherd. And there's a lot of hope because just as Jesus was able to heal the man that was blind, he's able to help those sheep who struggle to hear his voice. But there's also a great caution because we see that their guilt was connected to their insistence that they could see. And we see now in the sheep and the shepherd that our error is connected to our insistence that we hear the shepherd correctly. Their assumption that they could see kept them blind. And our assumption that we already hear God correctly could keep us from listening to his voice. And then we go to chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So let's just identify some of the characters here. In these verses, we have sheep. And the sheep are the church. We see that because in verse 11, it says that those sheep are the ones that the good shepherd laid down his life for. And then we see that there's a door and Jesus is the door. Verse 9, he says, I am the door. He is the only way to salvation. And then we see that there is a thief. So the thief is Satan. He is the one in verse 10 that comes to steal and kill and destroy. But if you take the illustration a bit far, further, the thief is any under shepherd, any leader of God's people that enters into the fold without going through the door of Christ. And then there is the shepherd. And Jesus says in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. So yes, Jesus is both the door and the shepherd. He can do that. He can do whatever he wants. Jesus is everything in this illustration. 
And you might take the illustration further to say an under shepherd would be one who leads through the door of the great shepherd. So that's the big picture of what we're talking about. There's a good shepherd who speaks and leads his sheep and their sheep who hear and follow. Verses three and four say, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Notice what the shepherd does. The shepherd speaks to the sheep and leads them. Notice what the sheep do. The sheep hear his voice and follow. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And this is how the church is designed to operate. God's church is a voice activated church. Voice activation technology has advanced to the point that is kind of weird. We have devices and machines and appliances, and some of these know our voice and they obey it. So you don't have to get up in the morning when it's cold, but you can give a voice command to your thermostat to turn up the heat in your house and you can stand under the covers for a few more minutes. And when you are ready to get up, if you go sit in your recliner and the sun's in your eyes, you can just tell your window shade to lower a little bit. And then you can give a voice command to your smart speaker and have some music played. And without getting up, you could start a hot drink by just giving a voice command to your electric kettle in the kitchen. Your whole house obeys your voice. You're in control, except if you talk in your sleep. Then you might burn your house down. But you know, there's probably a smart device that tells the other smart devices that you're sleeping and keeps those things from happening. There's so much connection. It's a hyper connected world and it gives us control. And there's something that just feels wrong about that. It kind of turns us into control freaks because it's not our voice that the world is supposed to follow. The thing that feels weird is it's the wrong voice in control. God's church is a voice activated church, but it's not my voice or your voice that activates the church. It is God's voice that activates God's church. So I want to think of God giving life to the church with the illustration of electricity getting to a light bulb. And there's a lot of ways you might get electricity to a light bulb. You can flip a switch. God doesn't do that. He has the power to flip a switch and turn things on and off, but he doesn't violate that whole freedom thing where he wants us to choose him. And so God doesn't force us in the way he leads us. That's not what the shepherd would do. You could hook up wires to a bicycle and pedal and generate your own electricity, which is kind of what we do sometimes, trying to manufacture life in the church by our own works. Well, God's not doing that. He's not breathing hard, out of breath, trying to pedal and keep up and supply us with electricity. And do you remember those clap-on lights? Clap on, clap off. God is not fueling the church with his applause. He's not impressed by what we're doing. Um, sometimes we try to do that, operating out of pride, and we feel that when people are happy, uh, the church must be doing good because they like what I'm doing. It's not about applause or us doing well. That's not how we get power. And it's not on a schedule. You know, we have the ability to program our, our lights in our home to come on at a certain time, go off on a certain time. That's not how we get power. God has not ordained a set schedule that he forces us into. And there's no way that we can vote it or decide we're going to have power. We're going to be activated on this day. We're going to do this and this routine. God works in his way and on his time and we respond. But none of these work because God doesn't violate freedom. He works in relationship with us. So the way that God gives power to the ch his church is in relationship by having a voice activated church. That's the one that requires the relationship of us to hear and respond. And so as God is leading us, as he's giving electricity to that light bulb, he could do it in any way he wants, but he chooses to do it by speaking and letting us hear and respond and follow. 
God's church is a voice-activated church. This truth is all over scripture. We see that God speaks and he's faithful to speak to his people. He's a communicator. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. He's given us his word to communicate to us. Amos 3, 7, for the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. God speaks through prophets. John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. God speaks through the indwelling Holy Spirit in our lives. Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims his handiwork. God speaks to us through creation all around us. God is faithful to speak. And God calls us to be people who listen. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Mark chapter 9, verse 7. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. That was the instruction that he gave on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my son. What are you supposed to do about it? Listen to him. He is going to speak to you. Listen to him. In John chapter 8, verse 47, whoever is of God hears the words of God of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. God speaks, his people listen. Romans 10 verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. That's how God designed his church. He's the good shepherd and he's faithful to speak and we're his sheep and we're just supposed to listen to that voice and follow him. I want you to listen to these words from the book, Desire of Ages, and this is from page 363. In all who are under the training of God is to be revealed a life that is not in harmony with the world, its customs, or its practices. And everyone needs to have a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. We must individually hear him speaking to the heart. When every other voice is hushed and in quietness we wait before him, the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. He bids us be still and know that I am God. Here alone can true rest be found. And this is the effectual preparation for all who labor for God amid the hurrying throng and the strain of life's intense activities, the soul that is thus refreshed will be surrounded with an atmosphere of light and peace. The life will breathe out fragrance and will reveal a divine power that will reach men's heart. When we can get past all the noise of this world, there is a calm and loving, faithful, voice of our Heavenly Father, and we can individually hear Him speaking to our hearts. And even when everything else is going crazy, God's will and His work are still advancing, and He's calling people into that, and He has all throughout history. And the way that we join Him in that is that He speaks to us, and we, we listen, and we follow our shepherd. That is what happened with Samuel. Speak, Lord, your servant, is listening. And think about so many others who were able to follow what God is doing. Think of Noah. Noah built this ark. He saved humanity. There was this remnant of humanity. He was faithful to God. Well, how did that happen? Genesis tells us, God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. And then God kept talking to Noah. And in verse 22, it says, 
Noah did everything that God commanded him. So God spoke and Noah listened. And we think of Abraham who left his homeland and went to a place that was not his own. It was the father of many nations. Well, how'd that happen? In Genesis 12, we read, The Lord said to Abram, leave your country. And a few verses later, we read, So Abram left as the Lord had told him. So you're probably getting the point by now. God speaks to us. But just in case it isn't clear, consider Moses, who led God's people out of slavery, and God spoke to him in a burning bush. Consider Paul, who was a great missionary, one of the greatest missionaries in history. And when he was Saul, God spoke to him on the road to Damascus and called him into his missionary work. Think of Martin Luther, the great reformer. He was spoken to by God when the words of Romans 1, 17 were impressed upon him. The just shall live by faith. Think of Ellen White who God has used as a mouthpiece and a pen to share his message with his church and who's one of the founders of a movement that's done so much good in the world. How did all that happen? Well, God spoke to her in many visions. And one of the early visions, she's confused and she hears a voice and it says, look up and look a little higher. And God spoke and gave clarity and ultimately Think of Jesus and the way he lived his life on this earth. He did nothing on his own. He did only what he heard from the Father. Isaiah chapter 50 is a powerful messianic scripture that tells us, it shows us the model of how Jesus listened to the Father. Listen to these words. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. Those are some powerful concepts. God wakens our ears morning by morning. We can listen like one being taught of God. We don't have to be rebellious and close our ears to him. But this is kind of the ideal for the church. The ideal is God speaks and we hear it and we obey it and we follow it. And that doesn't always happen. People don't always get along in the church. People don't always agree in the church. Sometimes we get some mixed messages. And these mixed messages don't just come because we stopped caring about the shepherd's voice. In fact, a lot of times they come because we do care and we are listening to the shepherd's voice And we believe we understand, and that gives us the conviction behind all of our not getting along. Because I'm hearing from the shepherd, and you don't agree with me. And so you must not be listening to the shepherd. And so the sheep get mixed messages. And what do we do when we get those mixed messages? Well, right in the text, we see some reminders that are true of us that might help us sort out what we can do with these mixed messages. Look back at verse 3, where it says, The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He calls us each by name. So he speaks individually to each sheep. When the sheep get mixed messages, it's possible that both are from God. See, we assume when it's a mixed message that one of them has to be wrong, And truth doesn't change, but truth is big. And so maybe what he's speaking to one and what he's speaking together aren't at odds with each other, but they actually fit together in the greater plan of God. So one way we can check ourselves when the sheep get mixed messages is to go a little further with the shepherd and see if maybe those messages are actually both spoken by the voice of the shepherd. And look at verse 5. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. All right, so we see that there is another voice here. And when things are going like they should, the sheep don't follow that voice because they don't know that voice. But when the sheep get mixed messages, it is possible 
that one or both of the sheep are listening to the wrong voice. Scripture says that not every spirit is from God. We should test the spirits. And not every thought that I've had about spiritual things is from God. I need to test myself and check myself with Scripture. Check myself with other believers. And here's how we should do this. When we check ourselves and look to see we're looking at the right voice, listening to the right voice, let's check us first. Rather than storming into a situation where sheep have mixed messages and assuming that someone else is listening to the devil, let's make sure we look at ourselves, take the log out of our own eye, then we can see clearly to help our brother. Because it's possible that we're not hearing the right voice and we need to help one another to tune our ears to the voice of the shepherd. And then we look at verse 6. It says, This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. There's a bit of irony here because Jesus is talking about his sheep hearing his voice, and then it says his followers didn't understand what he was saying. When the sheep get mixed messages, it's possible that both messages are from the voice of the shepherd. It's the right voice. We just don't understand the voice. We don't understand the message. Maybe we will have to wait some time before it's clear. We need to go further in seeking God before it makes sense to us, which means we need to have a whole lot of humility about following the voice of the shepherd. We might hear his voice, but there might be a whole lot more to it. Like Abraham, who accurately heard the voice of God that said, go sacrifice your son. He didn't understand that voice, but he kept following after that voice and obeying that voice until God made it clear to him. And so there's a lot of humility that we have to have in responding to his voice rather than declaring policies based on the limited understanding of the voice we hear. We need to come together in seeking after God that he can open our eyes to understand him more clearly. So there's a lot of ways the sheep might get mixed messages. But here's the thing. Mixed messages are helpful because the goal is actually to hear God's voice, not to prove that I hear his voice perfectly or that I hear it better than someone else, but to hear him and follow him. So in this way, it's an asset for us to have other sheep that might hear it a little different because we can check each other. We can correct each other. We can teach one another. And so the solution to mixed messages is not arguing or unfriending people or building ourselves up in the pride of our opinion. The solution is coming together and seeking God because those who hear God's voice a little different aren't enemies of our faith. They are assets to it. They sharpen us and they help us go towards God. They are not stopping us from following the shepherd. They're helping us clarify his voice so that together we can follow him better. Mixed messages can actually be helpful. And mixed messages are not going away. When we are with God for eternity, we are going to hear his voice perfectly and consistently with nothing interfering with our communication but right now we don't hear it perfectly and we get things wrong. And so mixed messages are not going away. But if we stop hearing God's voice differently, it might mean we stopped hearing his voice altogether because we're fooling ourselves if we all see it exactly the same. And so long as we have a heart for God, we're going to feel conviction. We're going to have things we, we need to stand on and we need to stand for and so we shouldn't ignore those convictions, but we should seek God together to better follow his voice because God's church is a voice activated church. At the beginning of this message, I reminded us of that business meeting we had back in January, the one where we began to pray the prayer, speak Lord, your servant is listening. And to be honest, I hesitate to focus our attention back there on that meeting. Because if you remember, it was a stressful meeting. There were some controversial points with strong feelings, some deep convictions, and we're going to have convictions. And that's a good thing. But it didn't feel good. It felt 
divided. Like there was a weight and we knew it wasn't right. And so what is the point of focusing our attention back there? I think there's some value in it because we're at a point of transition in our church. We're about to go back to using our facilities for our worship services. And when we go back, we're not going back to division and disunity. We're going back to a good shepherd who is faithful to speak. And I want to be the people, I want to be the sheep who are so interested in hearing his voice that we're going to lay down pride of opinion and hurt and feelings that were right. And we are going to seek hard after God so that he can be the leader of this church. He promised to be the head of our church. And we need that because I don't know how to lead a church. I don't know what's happening next month or what church is going to look like two months from now. We need Christ to be the head of this church. He's a good shepherd and we're sheep who listen to his voice. And we have a fresh start. When we come back, we get to choose the church we come back to. And there's so many good things about this church in, in the history and the foundation and where this church has been. I want to take all those good things and choose to come back to a church that follows hard after God, seeks him and wants to hear his voice and let him be our leader who realize that we are going to fail if the Holy Spirit is not poured out upon us to lead us. If you look through scripture at the way the church is designed, he is to be the leader. The church is perfectly designed to fail if God is not the leader, if God does not supply the power. And that's the church we're coming back to. We're coming back to a church that is going to seek hard after God. I want to share a story with you of revival. There is an incredible history of revival that happened in the Hebrides in the mid 20th century. It broke out in 1949. The stories of what God did during that time are amazing. And one of the things, the pieces that sparked revival was a prayer meeting. There's two sisters, Christine and Peggy Smith, and they prayed through the night for revival and they sent letters to an evangelist named Duncan Campbell. And eventually, he refused some of the first invitations. Eventually, he came and he was a central figure God used to bring revival in the Hebrides. And there's a story that he tells uh, to a friend who wrote a book. His friend's name is Wesley Dole, and he wrote a book called Let God Guide You Daily. And he recounts this story that Duncan Campbell told him. And it happened uh, towards the end of the revival. Duncan Campbell was out of the Hebrides and he was speaking at a conference in Ireland. He was scheduled to give the message the next day and he heard an inner voice that said, Bernere. And uh, he heard it again, Bernere. And he heard a third time the word Bernere. And he realized at that time that God was calling him to an island called Bernere. So he went to the chairman of the conference and said, hey, uh, you'll have to excuse me. The Holy Spirit's leading me to Bernere. And he says, hey, you're on to speak tomorrow. And he says, I can't, I can't help it. I got to go where the Holy Spirit's calling me. So he, he set out and he found a flight. He couldn't get into Bernere with a flight, but he found a flight to the nearest island that he could fly to. And he got out and looked for transportation by boat and he could not find anything there. But he found a fisherman and said, hey, do you know how to get to Burn Array? Fisherman said, I, I can take you for a fee. And he, he got him on the boat and got him over to the island and left him there on the shore. And then Duncan Campbell climbed up and he found that he was uh, near this farmer's field. And he walked into the field and saw the farmer and said to the farmer, could you tell the nearest pastor that Duncan Campbell has arrived. And they didn't have a pastor, so he said, hey, could you tell the elder? And uh, the farmer looked at him and said, well, the elder is expecting you. He has a place for you to stay, and he has already announced that you will be preaching at the meeting tonight at 9 o'clock. There was no letter 
since. Duncan Campbell had never even heard of the island Burneray. He knew nobody from there. He was not in any communication, but this elder had spent time in his barn praying three days before, and God had given him the message that he was going to send Duncan Campbell. So with no communication, he arranged for Duncan Campbell to speak, and God spoke to Duncan Campbell's heart and led him there. And so that night, he went to the prayer meeting, and God's Spirit was in that place, and revival broke out in the island a burn array. And in his memories in that book, Let God Guide You Daily, he recounts this. When God has people who prevail in prayer and people who know how to recognize the voice of the Spirit and obey without question, there is no limit to what God can do. That's what I want. I want God to move among us. The greatest sign of life in our church is not that the doors are opened to gather, but that our ears are opened to God. And I'm excited about the doors being open, but I'm desperate for our ears to be open. And we have seen that God's church can move forward without a building. God's church can move forward without so many of the good things we have. But God's church cannot move forward without the Good Shepherd. We are desperate for him to lead us, for him to be the head of this church. And as we close this service, as we close this, this season of our church, I want to pray and I invite you, um, if you're able, to pause and kneel with me as we pray and to commit our hearts and our lives and our church to God. If you're driving, um, kneel and pray later. Find a time when you can do that and kneel before God and plead with him that he would lead us at this time. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you are faithful that this gospel we teach is real, that you really do lead us and fill us with your life. And I just have a sense of great need. We have an exciting transition in front of us. It's going to be fun to see everyone. And when we come back, I want it to be all about you. And I want to get out of the way and I ask that you would just accept our, our offering right now of surrender individually and as a church that you would come among us and lead us without any restraint that there would be no limit to what you might do among us. We give you our hearts. We commit our church to you. We commit this transition to you that when we walk in this building on September 5, there would be the sweet spirit of Jesus here. And we would be reminded that this is your church. We surrender to you now. Thank you for being a faithful, good shepherd. And Lord, help us. Help us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.